Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Time's flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgebeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello. We've all experienced it. Embarrassing or unwanted issues, experiences, behaviours, patterns and responses repeating themselves over and again in various areas of our life, our relationships, at work, with colleagues, family, friends and money. Well, what if I were to tell you that many of the difficulties and problems in our lives don't begin with us and that the words we speak and the actions we take actually began in the bodies of our ancestors. Judy Wilkins-Smith is an international organisational, individual and family patterns expert, a systemic coach, trainer, facilitator and motivational speaker. She's the founder of System Dynamics for Organisations and Individuals, which utilises constellations to help performance individuals, Fortune 500 executives and teams, families and individuals decode their emotional and organisational DNA to break limiting cycles, resolve long-standing issues and transform challenges into lasting breakthroughs. Judy Wilkins-Smith joins me now to explain how exploring your emotional and organisational DNA can help resolve long-standing issues in any area of your life. Judy Wilkins-Smith, welcome. Hi, Sandy. It's lovely to be with you this morning. Good to have you here, Judy. So now tell me, we don't just inherit our physical DNA. We also inherit our emotional DNA. And that's where many of our difficulties begin. Tell me more about that. Sure. Yes, that's exactly right. And it's something that bears repeating. Yes, we do not just inherit our physical DNA. We also inherit our patterns of thoughts, feelings, and actions. And I call that your emotional DNA. And, uh, of course, this comes through generations, multiple generations of thoughts, feelings, and actions in response to events. So the decisions that we make about those events begin to create a language, begin to create sets of thoughts, begin to create feelings and actions that become mindsets and patterns and eventually become the truth. Only they're not the truth, they're your truth. And you can change that any time you want to. Okay, so how far back does this go? Can this go? Wow, all the way back to the beginning, I guess. Um, Typically, we look in situations, we'll look at two to three generations, but with some mega events, you'll see they go back many, 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 many generations, six, seven, eight generations. And as sophisticated as we are, we still get our information passed down through by by watching others, by what, listening to what they say, by modeling our actions on their actions. This is the way that we are in our families. Even when we don't know those families of origin, if we've been separated at birth, you will still find that there are inherent patterns of thoughts, feelings, actions that travel down through those generations and express through us. And of course, the ways that they express through us often are in our limitations. Now, that, that's not the only way. They can also express as profound strength. But most often when I see somebody, they've come to me because they're feeling limited, because they're feeling stuck. And as we look, what we find is you're not bumping necessarily just into you, but into your whole system. And the beautiful reason that it comes through to you is that it's time for it to change. You've now become too big for that smaller box. And so the irritation, if you like, or the stuckness, is really a profound way of saying, hey, wake up. It's time for you to move to something bigger, and it begins with you. 
And you say that if we can learn to decode this, we can transform our lives. Now, as you're saying that, I'm immediately thinking, well, that's torn it because now you've told me this. I have to change because if I don't, I'm hand, handing on these issues to my children <laughs> and my grandchildren. And I don't want to do that. Exactly, exactly. In fact, people will come to me and say, well, I don't want to do that. And I say, that's fine. I can wait 10 years to see your children. Uh, so, yes, you're exactly right. <laughs> the work you don't do is going to pass on to the next lot. But here's the piece that's even more important. It's not just do your work. That, that always sounds so difficult, right? Yeah. It's evolve your spirit, which is so much more fun. It's evolve your life. It's go have that adventure. We keep thinking that do your work has to be hard work and it's not going to be pleasant. Exactly the opposite is true. When you begin to understand the clues that have come to you and you begin to understand that beyond your stuckness or your limitations is the most incredible life, is everything that you wanted, you're going to want to go there. And when you've done it one time, I promise you, you're going to want to do it again and again and again because now you've just tapped into the other half of the language that we're born with. You know, I can understand what you're saying. I can understand that, you know, our children model their behavior on ours um, and we've modeled it on, you know, our parents and so on. So there's certain things that can carry through the generations unconsciously. We're unaware of them. But Completely what about um, things like thoughts? You know, when we can't, we don't know what somebody was thinking. Um, you know, we can... If somebody has a reaction, we can see that, but we don't always know what somebody's thinking. So how can thoughts and attitudes like that come down through the generations? Well, see, what you'll notice is those thoughts translate into words. So they will say to you, be careful, don't do that, watch out, that's dangerous. You shouldn't, you couldn't, you must, you ought to. And those are all the thoughts that are actually translating into a code of how should I behave? What do I need to do? And, and many of those are survival thoughts. And you can hear it in, you can hear very quickly if you listen to a parent or you listen to your own language. Am I speaking survival language or am I speaking future language? Am I orient, uh, orienting towards the future or to expansion? And so what you want to do is pay attention to the words you're, you're speaking because the words you're speaking and, and um, the way that you're, you're feeling around them become that nice juice that causes either action or inaction. So now you've got a beautiful alignment, right, um, of these thoughts, feelings, and actions, and that creates your limited world or your expansive world. And it's literally you who is creating it. But very often in response to... I want to belong in my family or my family system, so I must follow the following rules. And those following rules are all of the sentences that you hear, all of the reactions that you see and experience, and all of the things that you do to stay aligned with that system. Don't be loud, don't be rude, don't be greedy. You, you also talk about this kind of unconscious loyalty, even if we might not like something. There's an unconscious loyalty to our parents, and so we kind of adopt it regardless. Absolutely, and here's how it looks. Um, systemically, we will often tell you that you're either going to bond overtly or covertly to your parent. When the overt is not available and strong, you will still find a way to bond. And so suddenly you find that you loathed the alcoholism in your mother that you are now repeating. It's a way for you to bond. So you may not like it and you may not like her, but it connects you and it allows you to belong in your system. And belonging is very, very important to us. We just think that belonging often means that we've got to play small and we forget that sometimes belonging means we've got to expand and lead. Do you think this is true of things like physical ailments? I mean, I, I know people who um, have Crohn's disease and um, the daughter at the age of 14 suddenly developed Crohn's disease. But it's not necessarily, you know, an inherited disease. 
Do you think that there's a kind of, I'm bonding with my mother, I'm going to be like my mum, and, um, and the disease? Very, it's possible. It is possible. These are things that we see quite often, and sometimes doctors will refer to us when they've run out of answers. What I typically would ask in a case like that is at around the age of 14, what was happening for your mother or her mother? Was there a significant event that happened at that time? And what was happening for you at around the age of 14? And quite often in systems you will see repetitions not just of, of thoughts, feelings and actions, but also events and aspects of events, shades of events. Um, they come in a way that, that mimics what came before as a way to draw our attention to what is unsettled in the system, what is out of imbalance, who may be excluded or what may be excluded, to bring that back into alignment so that the system can functional, uh, function optimally and you can then function optimally too. So often if there's something that's happened further back in the system, it's almost creating a hole that subsequent generations all try to fill. And by trying to fill that, they're not present for their own lives. They're repeating an ancient history rather than creating a now and a future. Mm. So, well, when you talk about bonding, I mean, what happens if somebody is adopted? Um, you know, they don't see their parents, but they may be carrying these patterns in their DNA. And then they may inherit others from the adopted parents. Is that correct? Yes. You could either say they were twice blessed or twice oops. <laughs> One of the two. And really, if you look at it, they're twice blessed. I know when people say to me, I've had a, a, I've had a really traumatic upbringing, my, my response is, ah, so you have rich, fertile ground. Aren't you lucky? And they look at me as though I've, I've grown two heads. But the fact of it is, we've got all of this raw material waiting for us to shape it instead of reacting and repeating prior patterns when we start to shape it in our own way and we know or learn how to do that it becomes super interesting so if you've got from from adoptee material and your bio parents your chances are you've got you've got a double helping yeah I mean, it might, yeah. is it harder to unravel this if you've been adopted and you have n no knowledge of your parents at all? No, actually. I've worked with people who have absolutely no knowledge of their parents until I start to ask them, how are you different to your adoptive family? Tell me everything. Tell me all the physical pieces. Tell me the emotional pieces. What do you have that's so different? Where do you think it came from? It didn't just happen in a vacuum. Well, I've always had that, so where do you think it came from? So if we don't have specifics, what we do have is symptoms, and we can work with either. And both are very rich ways to look at, to look for the gift, to reframe what's trying to grow, because there is a problem is never a problem until you make it a problem. It's also only a problem once it's outlived its solution. So once we start looking at the problem as the gift, everything shifts. Because the minute you look at that, you're open to seeing what else does this have to offer me? How can I speak about it differently, think about it differently, feel about it differently? What different actions can I take? And so, of course, here we're getting into the neuroscience of um, your neural pathways. We know that with a trauma you can immediately lay down a neural pathway with all sorts of pieces that are very dramatically laid down because of the impact. What we don't realize is you can do exactly the same thing when you do the opposite. And if you look at athletes or high performers, this is what they do. They align the, the mind, they align the heart, they align the gut, and they get completely coherent with a new set of one thought, one feeling, one action that then becomes their reality. So, no, it, it really isn't that much more difficult. It may be interesting to decode, but it's not that much more difficult at all. Mm. You, said, you said that there are, there are benefits to these and this work and that we can actually turn some of those things into a positive. You refer um, in your book, you talk about a treasure chest of possibilities. 
I mean, how can you turn, for example, if somebody's got poverty consciousness, um, mm -hmm. how can you turn that into uh, a benefit? Oh, my goodness, yes. So you're sitting with this great poverty consciousness, beautifully inherited from all sorts of generations. The beauty of that is when you can look at that and go, thanks to all of you who came before me, I can look at the way I don't want it to be for me. So how do I want it to be for me? And here's, here's the pivot, right? Because the old pattern is the poverty consciousness. The new pattern that's trying to emerge through you is the abundance consciousness. So now instead of looking at money in a certain way and going, hate it, it's greedy, it's nasty, I'll never have it, I'm not worthy, we begin to shift those thoughts and feelings. In other words, we reprogram our library and, of course, our brain to, so what do I want? And this is the beauty of this work. In the frustration lies your affiliation many times to your ancestry. But in your dreams lies the promise and the legacy you give to your system. And that begins with you. There is great permission from the system behind you. In fact, it is saying, for goodness sake, expand so we can too. How did you discover this work, Judy? Hmm. Um, I discovered this work at a time when my father was killed in this country. We'd moved across to this country. Um, with all sorts of great thoughts and promises, he was killed here, and it was either write books or go crazy. And I decided going crazy didn't sound so good, so I went for the books. Um, and I was doing a particular piece of research, bumped into uh, somebody else who was teaching this work, and they said to me, come learn the work and I'll help you with the book. Long story short, I went and learned the work, but never got any help with the book. Um, but it... it that then took me into the world of constellations. I think sort of about two years in, I began to realize that with a large majority of constellations, where we focus is what is the cycle that is there? How do we break that limitation? And how do we bring it to balance? And it began to strike me as people ask me, okay, but now what? That there was a very strong transformational component to it that was itching to be explored. And uh, I also began to notice that we spoke two languages, the language of ancient history and the language of possibility. But most of us are raised with the, the language of ancient history. That's how we think we're evolving. The language of possibility and transformation was sitting right there. And epigenetics and neuroscience really helped bring that in for me. And so that's where I, I work a lot these days. So that's how I came to it. And you say that um, these relationship patterns can, can show up, they can sabotage or launch a career, they can influence our personal and our professional relationships, including things like our team and leadership capabilities. Can you give me an example here? Sure. Um, there are a couple of, of good ones. If you have somebody who all their life has been told you're not competent, you're not smart enough, you're good, not good enough, really you shouldn't be doing this, and they become a leader, what they're doing is they're sitting in two parts, and you can see it show up. So one part of them says, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to be that team leader. But if they haven't done the work on, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you shouldn't be doing this, they do a beautiful U-turn right at the point of success and wonder why. And suddenly you may have what we call a whirlwind leader, somebody who looks like they're a messiah, they're always solving problems, but nobody realizes that they're actually creating them too. And they're creating them from their, I'm not good enough, I, I shouldn't be doing this, who do you think you are situation. So what happens is they, they're then coming from the um, imposter syndrome point of view. And when I work with leaders in organizations, one of the first pieces of work we do is to see, are you an imposter? Because once we can identify that, the very next big insight is, no, you're not. You're actually a pioneer. You're daring to go beyond where others are. You're daring to ask questions that others might not. You're actually a pioneer, and that flips everything for them. And then we start to work with, so let's have a look at that limiting language. Where did it come from? Where did it first begin? What was the originating event? 
can we look at a different decision around that event? Can we look at different language? What is the one thing you could think differently? What is the one new feeling you could have? What is the one new action you, you could take? And when we have those aligned with, with what I call elevated emotions, so the higher emotions, that is the fuel that will take you all the way to your goal and to your purpose. So this becomes very important in leadership to identify your purpose and your goal because if you have that, it will pull you past all of the old language and past all of the excuses into the possibility. So now you use um, a term system dynamics along with a dimensional approach called constellations or interactive mapping to map out issues and connect the dots. Can you tell me what those words mean? Sure. So system dynamics is, is really about the patterns in the system. What's at play in the system? If we look at everything that's happening, what is the bottom line here? We don't trust each other or we're all poor or we all struggle or whatever it is that's a bottom line one that you're dealing with right now. So let's suppose you struggle with relationships. We then get to what we call a constellation, and a constellation is something that I use in just about every aspect of my work life, whether I'm working with an individual or whether I'm, I'm busy at an event, so anything from one person to a thousand people. And um, what we do is we literally take your issue, we, have a, we do a good history intake, and we identify the components of that issue. Now, this is, this is not anything new, but what we do with it is new and groundbreaking. You, you take a representative for each component. Typically, I will, take, I will use physical representatives where I can. Otherwise, I will use inanimate objects, but physical representatives are helpful. And so what I'll ask the person with the issue is, these are the components, do we have them? Yes. Okay. I want you to place them for me as it is in your mind. So we're taking your inner picture and we're placing it straight out in front of you. And what does that do? Now what you're doing is you're able to see it. They get a very quick sense of, oh my goodness, yes, this is my system, because we're very able to transfer emotions onto inanimate or other objects. So now they're able to see it, feel it. They're able to walk in it and interact with it. And by me simply asking systemic questions like, why is she facing out? Why is he facing in? They seem closer. Those seem more distant. What's happening over here? Why is he looking down? The client begins to see and interact physically with their issue. So because they've got multiple senses interacting, they're able to make much deeper connections and insights. They're able to actually see things they hadn't. What are the relationships between? Where are the tensions? What is the possibility? What's trying to evolve? What's blocked? And you literally see those, hear those, touch those, sense those in the moment. And of course, that starts to create a shift in the body and in the mind. And if, if people are aligned with that and they allow themselves to, to understand what's happened and to understand the possibility, what you can often see in a constellation is insight, resolution, possibility, or evolution. And many people will call that transformation. They're now no longer thinking the same thought, feeling the same feelings, or taking the same actions. So the same outcomes are literally impossible. Hmm. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest today is organizational, individual, and family patterns expert and motivational speaker, Judy Wilkins-Smith, whose system work with Constellations is helping Fortune 500 companies, executive teams, and individuals break through repeating patterns and limiting cycles that create difficulties in many areas of our life. Still to come, how to uncover the inherited patterns and hidden loyalties that determine your choices in your relationships. We'll be back with more from Judy Wilkins-Smith after the break. The future of Internet radio is here. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. 
Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single OM Times endeavor. Host your show with OM Times Radio Network. Vox Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Join me every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern on OM Times Radio for Vox Novus, the new voice. Mental health. Most people think it means mental illness. Most people are wrong. Mental health doesn't apply to just some of us. It applies to everyone. We're all susceptible to anxiety and depression. They're human conditions. And no person should ever feel embarrassed, ashamed, or be discriminated against for being human. Cracked the Podcast strips away the shame, fear, and stigma by expanding the conversation into areas less often visited. From brain and body chemistry, hormones, food, nutrition, trauma, and the microbiome, to pharmaceutical drugs, psychedelic substances, meditation, visionary experiences, and spiritual awakenings. Cracked the Podcast will explore them all, including the notion that, for many, Breakdown can be the beginning of breakthrough. For in the words of singer-songwriter Leonard Cohen, there is a crack in everything. It's where the light gets in. Cracked the podcast, slaying the dragons of mental health. Join co-hosts Sandy Sedgebeer and Rebecca Shaper on the first and third Thursday of every month at 12 noon Eastern Time. Coping 19, brought to you by CDC and the Ad Council. If you're feeling increasingly lonely right now, you're not alone. It's totally normal. Even though we may not be able to get together in person, connecting virtually with friends and family still gives you a chance to interact with people and may help raise your spirits. Join a virtual book club, set up group text chats, or online video coffee breaks with coworkers. Find more self-care and coping tips at coping-19.org. Welcome back. Judy Wilkins-Smith, I, I can understand what you said before the break about the, the constellations, the representations. Um, the thing that absolutely fascinates me um, is that the, when you have people, uh, real people, um, as your representatives, those people who may not even know the person um, will actually begin to reflect things as if they're tapping into whatever that issue is in, a, in their own way and highlighting things that may not have been obvious before. How are they doing that? Wow. Okay, so this is, this is a big subject, um, and it's one that, that gets tackled in various ways. In the, in the book, I talk about it quite a bit. We tap into what we call the knowing field, and the knowing field is the repository of all that has and has not been in our systems our history that goes back who knows how long. And we're, we're quite able to sense into that. We're also very able to sense into systems around us. If you look at children of divorced parents, they learn very quickly what will fly in one system and what will fly in the other. And they learn how to adjust from, from one system to the other. And we're very, very good at doing that. Once we step into somebody else's system, that system becomes active. And yes, we do have people who will say things that the client then says, how'd they know that? Where did that come from? This comes, again, as we said, from the knowing field. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. I mean, you really, you're talking about collective unconscious, aren't you? Picking up. Yes, we are um, in a way. We, yeah. are, we are absolutely yeah. tapping into that, yes. Yeah. And we're very yeah. good at doing it. We just don't know that we are. We've never been taught to do it. Is, is there a big difference when you're using human representatives or if you're using pieces of paper or post-it notes? Do you notice any difference? 
I would say yes and no. Yes, because you're going to get that, that extra feedback. But I will tell you that I've worked with uh, very sort of skeptical CFOs who tell me this is not possible and then proceed to work with me and we solve very complex problems using pieces of computer paper as the representatives and simply asking questions. And what I'll do is I'll say to them, can you walk over to that piece and tell me what happens as you do? When you stand in the shoes of that particular element that you've identified, what do you see, what do you notice, what's happening for you? And honestly, the, the, gen the, the insights that are generated are pretty profound. Um, I tend to see big eyes and a bit of a jaw drop quite often <laughs> after we've worked. And what it tells me too is that we're infinitely more tuned than we know we are. We think it's just our heads, it's not. I had somebody who was asked to work with me, the, the company asked them to work with me, and a um, very, very head person and said to me, I have no idea why they want me to use my heart and my gut, this is ridiculous. And I said, well, consider this, do you ever feel? Well, yes. What do you feel about the programs you do? I've got to be passionate, good, so we have feeling. Do you ever sense something? Uh, if, if you know that it's wrong, how do you know? Well, I just know. How? I know it in my gut. Good. So you now know that you are able to use your gut and your heart, and yet you're only giving your company your head. I think they're overpaying you by 60%. And he said, okay, we'll just do this. <laughs> so it's using all parts of us. It's literally learning to make the invisible visible and the unconscious conscious. And the more that we do that, the more we're able to tap into a field that has always seemed invisible but is not. Okay, so tell me, how, how can we, how can I uncover the inherited patterns and the hidden loyalties that are determining my choices in my relationships? Okay, good. So what we're going to do is you're going to start out with relationships and you would write out the sort of the general flavor of your relationships. I always leave, they always leave, they drop out on me. It's good and then it's not. So you would want to write that down as your heading. And then what I would do is say to you, uh, so we're going to take the first part, right, which is um, how do I uncover those sentences or how do I uncover the pattern? So uncovering the pattern, you would write down all of the things that you say about relationships. or You would um, write down then all of the things that you've heard your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, everybody around you say about that. That's going to allow you to start seeing what it is that you're picking up and making your own. So that's the first piece that you want to do. It's going to give you your thoughts. It's going to give you your feelings. And so you want to write down your feelings about it too. And then you want to write down the actions that you typically take. So that's going to kind of give you your recipe for you. Now, to understand the unconscious loyalty, what you then want to do is ask yourself, so when I struggle, who do I struggle like? Did my mother struggle like this? Was my father similar? Does it look like my uncle who was excluded or my aunt who was incarcerated? Which one of these am I emulating? Now you know what your hidden loyalty is. And by the way, it doesn't just have to be a hidden loyalty to a person. It could be a hidden loyalty to a promise or an aspect. So I promised God that when. And I talk about this too in the book. If you made a promise that makes you small, it is neither divine nor likely to be successful. Stop it. So to whom am I loyal? And when you know to whom you are loyal, then your next piece is to say, what is my biggest dream? Because that's where you'll start to pull clear out of what has you stuck into what's trying to express through you. And then what? I mean, if I was well, doing this on my own at home, and then what? Right. Okay, so the and then what is, so what is the one new thought that I could have around these relationships? What if? It was slightly different. One new thought. What would I tell myself? What is the one new feeling that I could have that has me jumping up and down, sitting with a sigh of relief, smiling or, or 
grinning with glee, what is that? And if I were to do just one thing differently, what would that be? This time I wouldn't run away. This time I wouldn't put down the phone. This time I wouldn't assume, because assumptions are just great things that kill us. Um, this time I'm doing it differently. And when you've got those three steps, if you will really invest in those three steps, the one new thought, one new feeling, one new action, with gratitude, with expectation, with excitement, do it for three weeks and watch your life shift. And it will. It's, it literally cannot stay the same. Do you, do you do this online for people? I mean, you know, I can see that you could do this in, in a public forum, but given the situation we're in now, can you kind of do it with people online? I do a lot of it online. I do a lot online, yeah. In fact, I would say up to 70% is on Zoom. And what I've learned is I, I have a lovely thing called an iPhone so I can create a three-dimensional space. And we work with that. The other piece to know, though, is that if somebody is, is on a telephone and they can't get to Zoom, I listen to the thoughts, the words, the feelings, and I listen to the actions. Because when you drop into that space and you're able to listen to what's actually happening, you can pretty much walk with the person to figure out how do we move from this to that. Mm. It's just nice when we have the physical components, of course because then you're able to, to stand there in the moment. But I will tell you that on Zoom and, on, and via telephone, I've had people with profound shifts because they're ready. They've stopped resisting. There are no more good reasons to do it the other way. And so what they're doing is they're pretty much aligned. It's what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what I'm doing is about to be on the same ship. And when that happens, you've got rocket fuel. And you also train others to do this. So therapists could, um, you know, maybe hypnotherapists or psychologists or other people in, you know, who are dealing with the public um, could actually incorporate this into the modalities that they offer. Absolutely. I work with, as you said, therapists. I work with change management. I work a lot with HR. I work a lot with coaches. Um, yeah, I work with all sorts of different people and then select numbers of them are trained um, as we're building the community and as it's expanding, I need those good hands w uh, with me in a room. So, yes, they are trained to be able to do this too. Mm. And it's pretty yeah, actually, you know, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go continue, please. Sure. I was going to say... I think the thing that intrigued me the most about constellations when I started was it, it was sort of this mystical, divine, one or two people could do it or could ever teach it. Or, and this is not so. It's really become more and more of a professional approach. And, and that's very much the way I approach it. Is it logical? Is it teachable? Is it achievable? Is it communicable? Is it useful to both a career and a private person? And how do we use that? And so that's what they train to do. Mm. What did you, I mean, when you were learning this, obviously you did it on yourself. What did you discover? Um, I discovered all sorts of interesting things. I discovered uh, my library of being small, which was exactly what led to, if you, if you go to my website, it says, how big are you willing to be? And that's a question I ask all of my clients because it's, it's truly the first time when you say yes that you are service, in service of the universe and properly taking responsibility for growing your own life. And I realized that I was very much responding to the system. Be a good girl, be a nice girl, don't ask for much, play small, be kind, be sweet, all good things, but I really wasn't paying attention to what I was capable of bringing and to how big I could be in, in the very best way because being big means I'm never settling for for small, inadequate, average, I'm not telling myself that stuff. So it was, it was really starting to shift my own mind and saying, is God going to hit me with a piece of, of two by four? No, he hasn't yet. Okay, I'll keep going. So I also discovered a very rich inner spiritual dialogue, not only with the divine, but also with things like money. Um, 
and I promise to give money a very, very kind space in the world because we have such such incorrect or, 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 or such limiting feelings and thoughts about money. So it kind of really expanded the thought process, I guess, but certainly showed me to whom and, and where I was loyal. Absolutely. In fact, I still will unfold lots of those pieces where something happens and I go, okay, hold on a minute. Is that really mine? Or am I holding that for someone else? Yeah. Is there any... Have you found anything this doesn't work on? Um, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not well, yet. Give me, give me some... Give me some um, interesting case histories. I remember reading um, uh, something about somebody who had a pattern in the family of um, physical, a physical pattern of large legs. Um, yes. Tell us about that. So the large legs. I mean, when you sit in, in my chair, I get the most interesting things that people will come to me with. Now, when they come to me with a sentence, I've got to listen very carefully because it can sound odd. And um, this person came in and said to me, okay, I want a good relationship and I want to look good, but I have these thick legs. I need to understand these thick tree trunks. It's a very interesting way to go into what is my relationship pattern. And I'm suddenly going, oh my goodness. <laughs> but as we looked at it, we discovered that she had, uh, going back in the family for about seven generations, all the women talked about these tree trunks of legs, about having to be these super steady legs. They actually referred to themselves as the legs of the family. But what became even more interesting was that all of the men that were married to these women and in that family system on that side had lost a leg every single one of them and usually the right leg which is typically the masculine and when we went back and looked at the first loser of a leg father disin uh, disowned son and son came out uh, to the US as an immigrant and lost his leg and it was literally every single man here was the kicker she had adopted out a child and she found him after she started doing this work. And when she found him, his leg was in a cast and he had pins in the leg as well from a severe injury. And they didn't know if they'd be able to save the leg. And she worked with him to say to him, you don't have to do this the same as the rest. And he never lost the leg. So this, this pattern is repeating itself. The women are... The legs of the family, so that's a yes. metaphor for you know we're taking over, we're Which we're being they the stability. Had to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then other members of the same family then have partners who come from different families who lose their legs. Yep. Wow. How wild is that? How wild that is, is that? And that here that is wild. Piece. Yeah. Here was the other piece when I said to her. In a relationship, so think about the legs. I said to her, in a relationship, who is dominant? She said, oh, I carry the weight. I do mine and theirs. I said, of course, there are your tree trunks. When you start to be okay to take your place and not both places, this may shift for you. You mean it would actually shift her f physiology? That the legs It can not shift the physiology because now she doesn't have to carry that weight and that shape to be able to survive anymore. Did you keep in touch with her? Did you find out? I kept in touch with her for a long time. She doesn't have, or didn't have, she's passed since. Didn't wow. have tree trunks. Wow. Interesting one. Very interesting. What other um, really astonishing things have you come across? Um, you know, I, I, there are so many. Um, lots I'll of bet. physical ones. Pardon? I said, I'll bet. Yeah, um, many physical ones where people, once they realize they don't have to hold on to the physical component, that, that gene expression no longer has to happen and things will shift physically. But I think also understanding things like, like the language we use. I think I'd, I'd shared with you before about a girl who came in or a woman who came in 
very upset because she couldn't connect to her family because they were all very non-emotional and she was the opposite. And she said, you know, my brother was really, really good with them because he was very kind of dispassionate and detached, just like they were, very contained, minimal emotions. And she said, and I'm so different. And I only ever got little drops of love from them because that's all they had for me, just little drops of love, whereas he could connect because he was so like them. And when we had a look at the history, of course, it went back to the Holocaust. And they had to run and they had to escape. And the sentences were pretty much suck it up. Don't have emotion. You've survived. Be grateful. That's it. So then I said to her, because she kept on and on about this little drops of love, little drops of love. And I tell people to pay particular attention to the language they use. And she, I said to her, let's go back to those little drops of love. They weren't able to express much, were they? And she said, no. And I said, but the little bits they could, they gave to you. Yes. What kind of a mother are you? I'm an amazing mother. I connect with my kids. I have great community. I said to her, so isn't it remarkable? They gave you all that they had, even though it was little drops. That's all that they had, but they gave it all to you. And look at what you've grown. Mm. And so suddenly she felt incredibly connected, incredibly empowered. She was doing work not just for her, but for her system. And suddenly she could bring to the system what had gone missing. She could reinstate flow. She could do what was needed to be done for that to start growing again. And she had all the time thought that she was the failure instead of the forward creator. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's reframing, isn't it? Completely. And this is, this is what I said to you in the beginning, we have two languages, and we don't speak them both. We are brought up to speak, well, it's not even two languages, it's one language, and we speak only half. So the half that we're taught growing up is, be meek, be kind, be gentle, be mild, be small, um, don't ask for anything, try and die nicely, live a decent life, and we're not taught you're possible, you can, you're big, you're capable, you're a creator, you're transformative, you're quite able to create the remarkable. We're not taught that. It's not that we can't do it, it's that it hasn't been activated. But when you move beyond your limitations and into this frame of mind, frame of thinking, frame of feeling, that's when you start to see people have a purpose, have a goal, stand up in the world, make a difference, because they've suddenly discovered that, that half of their language and they're not about to go back through the other door. Hmm. So you must have seen some amazing turnarounds in, in business I've and seen in, in people's lives. Yes, I have. I've seen incredible turnarounds. I've literally seen somebody who'd been trying to do a business deal for five years, did a piece of work, went out at the break and came in with eyes as big as saucers and said, oh my goodness, I just got the call they've signed. So I've seen multi-million dollar deals happen that way, many of them. But I've also seen people literally come in on two walking sticks, not be able to move much, severely overweight, come back six months later, Six sizes smaller, no sticks. Nobody knew who they were. Um, people who've had medical conditions that have really kept them limited, only to discover to whom they were loyal in the ways they were limited and ill, and for that to shift for them so that they didn't need to express it anymore. So it's pretty much anything you can think of I have seen and been privileged to see. Because these people are incredible. They're doing the supernatural. They're becoming the beings they were meant to be. Mm. Well, this is an incredibly powerful piece of work and I've looked into it quite um, closely. And um, I think it, it's so transformational that I just want to tell everybody that you have agreed to join me for a special web series designed to explore our emotional and organisational DNA so that we can resolve any of our long-standing issues with family, relationships, money 
or career and that this uh, we're going to start a once a month web series beginning on June the 3rd um, and tell me a little bit Judy about this series and the different areas of life that we will be covering over the next seven months. Absolutely. I am super excited to be doing this because for me it feels like this has got to be in as many hands as possible with as many people looking at life through a completely different lens and, and living a good one. So, yes, we will, be, we will begin with emotional DNA. What is it? How do you inherit it? What do you do with it? How do you grow it? So we'll really pull that apart. We'll look at what are systems, because we really don't know the ins and outs of systems, and, and people who, who come to this will begin to know their systems intimately. What are the systems? What lives there? What are the gifts in that system? What can we do with them? So that's emotional DNA. Then we'll probably go to relationship DNA, and I know, lo- and this is not just your personal relationships. This is your career relationships, because what affects you in one area of your relationships is going to spill over into the others. So we'll look at those and we'll pull that apart. Then we'll look at leadership, organizational, and then I'm pretty much guessing that people are want, going to want to hear about things like success and money. And how does that operate for me? How can I really get it to operate? Is this truly possible? Yes, it is. Hint, it is. Um, and how you do it for you. Honestly, this is a way that you begin to change your life. So with leadership, I mean, if there are listeners who are not in business, for example, are we talking about leadership in any area of life? You know, maybe leadership someone who's not... Leadership in any a, area. Yeah, okay. So it could Even be... Even in you your know, own um, life. Yeah. Yeah, being the leader in your own life, being the leader as a mother, being the leader as a community person... There is a leadership piece in every single one of us that is is called into being at some point. Mm, Yeah. Okay. So it's understanding that. Okay. Well, I'm really looking forward to this uh, next seven months with you and to the transformations that we're going to see, not only in my life, um, but in the life of our listeners as well. So you've also got a couple of um, events coming up. Can you quickly tell us about them? We've only got less than a minute. So in a nutshell. I can, very quickly. In a nutshell, I have some coming up in June. They will be online, Zoom, um, very effective. June, I believe, 10, 11, 12. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it's 10, 11, 12 or 11, 12, 13. Um, and then we have in July as well. Best way for people to find exact dates is going to be to go to my website. And I'm just having a look now for you. It would be the 11th, 12th, and 13th of June. And that will be emotional DNA, which is the foundational piece. Okay, good. Well, Judy Wilkins-Smith, this is, this is a, an absolutely fascinating, life-transforming topic and incredibly powerful. Thank you for agreeing to join me and gifting this to our listeners. And thank you for joining me today. Sandy, I can't wait to join you. I am thrilled to be invited. Let's do it. Yes, absolutely. Let's do it. Judy Wilkins-Smith, thank you. And you can find out more about Judy's work at her website, judywilkinsmith.com. And that's a dash between the Wilkins and Smith. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back with another edition of What Is Going On at the same time next week. Till then, it's goodbye from me.